Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. This season, I'm having conversations with CUNY newsmakers, the teachers, researchers, writers, artists, and activists who are shaping students and the world. My guest today is Taya Abrecht, distinguished lecturer at Hunter's Creative Writing MFA program and the author of Inland, one of the most talked about novels of the season. The characters in Inland include a Balkan immigrant and fugitive from the law who rides a camel all over the West, a female homesteader who is fighting to maintain home and family in the desolate Arizona territory of 1893, and an orphan girl who communes with the dead. Published by Penguin Random House, Inland is like no other Western you've ever read. And in our interview today, Taya will explain what motivated her to write it. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I've read other books about the West, but yours is truly unusual. Now, it's about some of the things that we already know about, the rough, hard scrabble life of those who lived in the West of the 1890s, about their endless quest for water, which you really dramatize here, about homesteaders who are hoping that the railroad will come to their town, about the white settlers' touchy relationship with Indians, about greedy, unscrupulous land grabbers. But you add to that, um, as I said, an immigrant outlaw from the Balkans who rides all over the place on a camel, a tough but beleaguered frontierswoman who is waiting for her husband to return home with the desperately needed water and whose oldest sons have disappeared, and the ghost who seemed to inhabit everybody's lives as if they were their daily companions. How did you choose these characters and this story? So I, uh, I had been spending some time in the West um, over the last several years while, while I was searching around for the story to write uh, after, after the Tigers. You live White. in Wyoming now. Uh, right? I don't. I actually live in, I live in New York, but I oh, spent okay. time in Wyoming. Okay. Um, so still, still a New Yorker. Um, actually, I, I don't think I can call myself a New Yorker. I haven't lived here 10 years yet. So, um, but um, I had been spending a lot of time in Wyoming and a lot of time in Arizona, and I was um, really interested in, in the way that I felt called home to the to the area, um, which is odd because I, I didn't grow up there. You know, I'm, I'm from the former Yugoslavia. We came here uh, when I was 12 years old after the war, um, and I uh, so I have no cultural, no familial connections to the place, and 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 yet felt very homesick for it, which was odd, um, and something that I felt was was very um, sad at the heart of the way we mythologize the West. Uh, and I came across this podcast about something called the Red Ghost of Arizona. Uh, it's a true campfire yarn insofar as a campfire yarn can be true it was it was it was told around the turn of the century about this great shaggy red beast that um, attacked homestead homesteaders on their ranches um, and particularly encountered these two women had a very uh, violent encounter with these two women and the podcast uh, which is called stuff you Mister uh, missed in history class um, connected this campfire yarn to the story of the United States Camel Corps about which I had never heard before, despite all my research into the West. Um, the United States military brought camels over in the 1850s to serve as pack animals in the Southwest. Uh, and I was just astonished by, by this history. And I was particularly astonished by the Balkan connection because with them came young men from what was at the time the Ottoman Empire, just like where I was from was also part of the Ottoman Empire. Which is where they got the camels? They had gotten the camels sort of from, from all over the Middle East. There was okay. a camel shortage going on at the time. So they, they, were, they sort of put them together from various places. Um, but, uh, I, and I was just intrigued by this history and particularly by this uh, convergence of different stories. Um, the story of a great journey and the story of somebody waiting to be on the receiving end of that journey. And that's where Nora and Lurie came from. Um, so the campfire story, the two women who were attacked by this great red hairy bee, was it a camel? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just went wild and... <laughs> yeah, it had, been, it had been roaming around for, uh, for years and years, it seemed, uh, with a very, very strange, um, in a very strange condition. Okay. And uh, they were astonished by it. I mean, they couldn't recognize what it was. And, and 
you know, for a long time, people were like, there's a great red horse walking around. It's, it's bigger than any horse I've ever seen. Uh, and then someone who had seen a bit of the world um, recognized what it, what it actually was. And it was a camel in Arizona territory. Wow. I was really amazed by your knowledge um, as somebody who's originally from Yugoslavia, by your knowledge of the English language and by your knowledge of the Western landscape, of the plants and trees, the animals, the changing skyscape, and the words that you use to describe them. I'll read just uh, one passage. Whoever had thought to instate a watering hole in this spot could not have been a woman. It was impossible to linger here without feeling observed. The goblin barons rose up on either side of the path ahead bulbous gnomons, knotted terraces, wedge-headed hoodoos, each a narrows into some other world. Eastern dudes were known to pay good money to be brought through here and stand around in their frills, trying to guess where in this maze of stone some outlaw or another had laired in the old days. I have to say that I was tempted to read your book with the dictionary nearby, but I decided to just go with the flow. So where did you acquire <laughs> this vocabulary? Um, I did a lot of research into, when I, I, I first researched um, the United States Camel Corps and sort of got the base knowledge for that. But as it became clear um, that history had set the terms of what the narratives were going to be, that there was going to be this, you know, 40 year narrative on the camel side and then this a single day in Nora's life. Uh, and it became clearer and clearer that everyday vernacular, um, everyday circumstances were going to have to be a huge, huge part of her story. Um, I started researching newspapers and uh, journals and, and uh, letters that, that people sent and trying to get a feel for the language. Um, I also came across this book called The Dictionary of Americanisms, which is a really, really fascinating compendium of idioms and turns of phrase that were used uh, uh, sort of between the 1860s and, and the turn of the century. Um, there, was a new, there were new editions coming out all the time. And I was fascinated, uh, particularly by the fact that the idioms were divided by region. Um, and I realized that I was going to have to come up with dialects for respective parts of the book, regardless of what language background the characters came from. So in Nora's section, in Amargo, uh, people speak a certain way, regardless of whether they're coming to Amargo from an English or a Greek or a Spanish-speaking background. Um, and then in the, uh, in the camel section, it's, it's the same thing. They have their own sort of uh, massed dialect. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I, I made up some words, you know, I, I found words that they uh, sort of made portmanteaus of, of uh, words that I discovered that were archaic, and 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 I had a lot of I had a lot of fun with the language. I'm not sure that some of the words I think you, you aren't in the dictionary and in okay. any dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's unique to your book is that a number of the characters are not just the usual Irish and Scots and Mexicans and Indians and the occasional Chinese that we think about being in the West, but Slavs, Greeks, and Mi Middle Eastern people, people that we don't usually associate with the Old West. Yeah, I, you know, I, I grew up with cowboy westerns, uh, I think like everybody did, even though, even though um, I'm from the former Yugoslavia, the, the reach of that mythology is so powerful and so pervasive um, that it reached even there. Um, and um, I knew that the history of the West was obviously a lot more complex than mythology because one of one of the guiding principles of a larger mythos is that it has to be simple, right? Uh, it has to, to feature um, very little variety and um, tell one definitive narrative. And but I, 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 it still did not prepare me for the tremendous complexity of the history of particularly the Southwest. Um, and and I just felt so. Uh, fortunate and, and enthralled by um, tremendous variety of stories that were actually there. The people came from all over. There was a, a tremendous intermingling of, of cultures and, and language and cuisines. Um, and, and just sort of the way households came together was really, really interesting. And I, I wanted to explore the stories that I, that I, hadn't, that I hadn't heard. 
women led especially hard lives in the West of those days. Um, is that what you wanted to show in your characters, Nora and Desma and Josie, not just the hard work they had to do, but their inner longings? I did, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go into the mind of the woman who's always scowling in the corner of the Western, you know? I feel like she's a very, very uh, familiar trope. Um, I, I think this book ended up being about isolation to a tremendous degree. And I, I'm always curious about the way people operate when, when they're alone and, and the way people uh, inhabit their own minds and their own bodies um, and find ways to cope with it. And I think that's, uh, Nora was, was the perfect vehicle for that. Um, yeah. Now, Lori, what was his real name? What was his, uh, Lori wasn't his real name. It was his. Lori wasn't his, his real name. He doesn't have a, he, it was, it, well, Lori was the, the name that, that he ends up having, um, but he can't remember the name that his father used to call him. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, in, the, in the beginning of the book. Okay. He's a camel riding Balkan outlaw. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he and his camel, Burke, where'd they spring from? I wanted to, uh, I knew I was going to write about the Camel Corps. Um, I, I took a long time to explore which of the, of the characters' perspectives uh, was going to be the, the most instrumental for, for getting into that narrative. Um, Haji Ali and Greek George, who are, who are two of the Cameleers who also appear in the story, were real people. And so my initial impulse was to tell the story from their point of view. But owing to certain historical facts by which the narrative is constricted, um, I couldn't use either of them because you you don't you don't get the ending of the book as it is now by using either of them, um, and so I knew that the person who narrates and and uh, for whom the camel section is is most impactful had to be someone for whom. Uh, the experience of joining the Camel Corps and having this special bond with Burke uh, would be formative and would feel uh, like a kind of return to, to selfhood. Um, and he finds his way home, I think, uh, Lurie does. Lurie finds his way home to his past through this connection that he has with the Camel Corps. Burke, the camel, doesn't speak in the book or have thoughts, I think, that we know of, though it sort of feels like he does. But he's a real character in the book, and there's a real relationship, real bond between Lurie and, and, and Burke. And in fact, in a lot of the camel parts, Lurie's talking to Burke. Mm -hmm. He's addressing yeah. Burke. Um, anyway, we're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with Taya Abrecht, the author of Inland, after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Taya Abrecht, the author of Inland. What's with Josie, Nora's <laughs> cousin by marriage, who saw ghosts and commune with the dead? What was the point of putting her in the book? Um, Josie is, uh, I think, Josie, in Nora's view, exists largely to, to annoy Nora and, and drive her to tremendous derision and despair, I think. Um, Josie's a manifestation of, um, I think, the anxieties of the period. Um, as the 19th century was drawing to a close, uh, the tremendous amount of technological innovations that had happened in such a short period of time that had changed the way human communication worked and the way human thought basically worked, um, I think produced a, a tremendous amount of vulnerability in, in people. Um, and spiritualism became of tremendous fascination uh, to a great many folks all over uh, the United States who, who previously hadn't um, taken it on board as a, as a real thing. And Josie is, is there, she's a medium, she's, she's, a, she's a clairvoyant, um, or at least she's been raised to be one. And Nora finds her extremely galling uh, because she, she thinks that she's a, a charlatan. Mm -hmm. um, I, which is ironic because Nora has been carrying on a conversation with the imagined spirit of her own dead daughter for these last 17 years. 
So much of the book is about people who wander from place to place, year after year, trying their hand at different things. Men who long for their women but don't see them for months or years. Women who long for their men but rarely see them. This seems to be a theme of the book. Yeah, it's, um, I think one of the things that I found particularly fascinating when I did the research was this, um, the way that we mythologize the endless possibility of the West. And, 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 and you know, uh, there's this romanticized hardship that underlies the possibility that you could be anything. And if you, you know, if you just try your hand at prospecting or assaying or uh, teaching, you, you know, you can, you can excel at any of these, these trades and, and they require a lot of a person, right? They require a constant state of change. Uh, but those, that endless possibility was available essentially only to, to white men, with very, very few exceptions. Um, Nora's husband, Emmett, is one such person. Um, and that, uh, that dynamic, I think, comes from, uh, it, it was so, so, so prevalent in so many diaries. <laughs> in so many diaries I read where the women were like, Just going moving. along with whatever yeah. the men chose to pursue yeah. at a particular point yeah. of time. And of course, her husband was a newspaper editor, That's owner. Right. That's right. There's a strange group of characters in the book, many of them shifty, violent, and scabrous. But you seem to have a kind of grudging respect for these people who carved out lives for themselves in this difficult terrain. I think one of the great pleasures of the Western is the cast of hard scrabble supporting characters. Um, and I think one of the difficulties of supporting characters is that as you develop them, you become incredibly attached to their narratives and you try to stuff as much of them as you can into the book. People like Desma or Ray Ruiz. Um, and the, the limitations of the form are such that um, these people uh, can only be, you know, uh, unearthed to, 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 to a certain degree before, before you have to move on with the narrative. But uh, I, I learned so much and <laughs> try to stuff as much of it as possible in. But yeah, I think anybody who, I have a tremendous amount of respect for people who survive anything. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a favorite character? Did I have a favorite character? Um, I think, I think maybe, maybe my favorite character was Haji Ali, actually. I think. Um, one of the camel riders. One of the camel riders. Yeah, I, I felt a lot of, uh, you know, as I started writing this book, um, I think I, I, I was having a lot of conversations with my grandmother about what her life had been like um, and the difficulties with which she had grown up. Um, she was uh, a, a Muslim growing up in Mostad in a nation that uh, marginalized her particular ethnicity. Um, she had a lot of she had a really difficult childhood, really difficult young adulthood, and, and you know, was a woman in a time when um, it wasn't particularly um, easy to be a woman. And uh, not, that it, not that it is now, uh, but she, um, she had a lot of thoughts about identity as she was uh, on her deathbed, which was right around the time that I started writing this book. And, and I think a lot of her concerns fused with Haji Ali, and with Nora too, but with Haji Ali in a very, very particular way. Why did you choose the title Inland? Um, I once read in an article um, of, the, of the period, I think, I think from the 1870s, uh, about the railroad. Um, the article was discussing the railroad, and they referred to a town that was away from the railroad as being inland. And I thought, what an amazing concept, like how important, the, how much centrality the railroad has been given in these people's lives, that to be inland of something is not to be inland of the coast, but to be but inland, inland of, of, the the rails. of the railroad. And, uh, and it just, it really stuck with me. And this was years before I started writing this book, and I, I sort of filed it away in my title bank. And when I wrote the first words of this book, I saved it as inland. Because if the railroad came close to you, if, you st or if the train stopped in your town, I mean, that could make the town. Absolutely. Make or break the town. Absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, prosperity or not, you know. Um, and that's, and that continue, I mean, that has continued to be the history of America in so many ways, right? If the railroad comes or if the freeway comes or mm -hmm. if the factory comes, then, then the, town, the town's life cycle rises. And all art is about that the purpose of all art is 
revelation. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what the revelation of this book was supposed to be. Mm. And maybe you can just tell. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can just tell me. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you that, that, that all art is, is, is about revelation, but I also think all art is particularly uh, literature is about personal revelation. Um, reading is such an intimate and personal experience and you can hope as an author that um, you can rely on your reader bringing a certain kind of luggage to the party, right? Um, and I think that with something like a Western where you're, where you're playing with the tropes of the genre, people are more likely to bring the same kind of luggage than not because we've seen these tropes so many times. Um, but, but the ending this book, I think, um, is, I think the revelation of the ending is, is an indiv individual thing. And so for me to tell you, I can tell you what the ending meant to me. What did it mean to you? Um, I started writing the book because that convergence that happens at the end seemed so unlikely and so wondrous and so otherworldly to me. And I wanted to understand the emotional and psychological condition of the people who participated in it. Uh, and I wanted to understand why I was so moved by it um, and what it would mean to them to have that convergence. And that was, I think that was the purpose of the whole book for me. Um, is there a message in it that's particular that I want someone, a, a, another reader to, to, to carry away? Um, I, I can't say that, 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 I, that I know what that is. Yeah. Um, but yeah. What did you learn from researching and writing this book? Gosh. Um, I think one of the reasons that I started writing this book was because I was so fascinated by what makes stories live or die. I couldn't understand why the camels weren't part, a bigger part of the mythos of the West. Um, and I think what I learned was that the systems that exist to carve up narratives and simplify narratives and unify all of history or an attempt to unify all of history under the banner of a single narrative are still very much in place. Um, and hopefully, you know, the chorus of voices that's rising out from different parts of, of American life is chipping away at those bigger narratives and showing that actually it is, it's just a massive, massive pool of stories that aren't, uh, that are unified by very few things other than, than um, striving and surviving um, and doing the best for the ones we love. You mentioned, in, I think in one of your interviews, that there are certain themes that an author will feel compelled to return to over and over. What are yours? Ah, um, I think death is a really big one for me. Um, a lot of my characters, um, I meet a lot of my characters at the crossroads where they're trying to decide whether life is simply the world around us or whether there's uh, a, a bigger picture, whether the supernatural exists. Um, and that's something that's never gone away. Um, I think the relationship between people and animals too. Okay. Um, and the relationship between people and objects actually. There's a lot of talismanic work in, in, my, in my writing uh, and it just sort of sneaks in there. You have said that, you know, each reader's personal revelation from the book is gonna be different. Mm -hmm. But what in general would you like readers to take away from the book? That history is vast and complex and full of stories we don't know. And um, we should seek them out. So you teach creative writing at Hunter. Uh, these are master's degree students. Yes. Uh, hoping to become fiction writers, I, I, I assume. Are there any particular lessons that you really try to drum into your students' heads? Yes, there's so many. <laughs> um, I think the biggest lesson I've certainly learned and, and what I keep trying to sort of convey is that the relationship to the work itself is the most Im important thing. 
um, that there are no wasted drafts and that even if you write, I wrote a lot before I even arrived at the idea of Inland, um, at the foundational story for Inland. And um, it felt like failing all the time. And I think students in particular, when you're at the beginning of a project um, and it seems like maybe it isn't going to be the thing that you wanted it to be or, or maybe it isn't going to get published, um, they, they despair. It's a very <laughs> it's a terrible feeling because you've just invested all this time and work into something that is just going to go into a drawer. Um, but what that's done is buttress your ability and make you the next phase of the writer that you're on your way to being. Um, and it's important and it's tough, but it's, it's so <laughs> formative. Um, and it steals you against a lot of things that you're going to have to armor yourself for later on. So that's, that's you know, just keep trucking. Keep plugging. Even it, yeah, keep, even if it doesn't feel like you're moving anywhere. Okay. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I'd like to thank Taya Abrecht for joining me today. Inland is published by Penguin Random House and is available online and in bookstores. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.